Welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 45, Competition Repertoire Guides with Amy Porter. Before we get into today's show, I would like to share with you a wonderful flute company. Founded in Boston, Massachusetts in 1888, the William S. Haynes Company creates bespoke professional concert flutes and head joints for flutists around the world. These sought-after instruments are prized for the rich and colorful timbre that only a Haynes instrument can offer. The master flute makers at the William S. Haynes Company are constantly listening to the current needs of flutists so they can craft an instrument that meets today's requirements. Their dedication to the Boston tradition of flute making and meeting the demands of a modern flutist is carried through every instrument which bears the Haynes monogram. Follow them at Haynes Flutes on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Welcome everyone to another Flute 360 podcast episode. Today I'm with Amy Porter, and we are going to talk about specific repertoire guides for upcoming flute competitions. Welcome, Amy, and thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, thanks for having me, Heidi. Great. So let's talk first about competition advice. What is some advice that you give to your students when they are preparing for a competition? Well, I often talk about my advice in terms of a lecture that I give called Competitions, Repertoire, Research, and Rewards. And I think you have to look at it that way. You have to ask the question, why am I doing a competition? And some of the questions can be ranging from where do I fit in, in terms of locally or nationally, or in terms of your school, or just in terms of your heart, you know, you just want to know if this is the right thing to do. So a competition is a great way to expand repertoire and expand your why, as we call it. And then also the rewards of competitions are just incredible in terms of confidence and experience. And it quiets your mind a little bit more to know that you've been through it and you don't have to dream about it any longer. You know, the harsh realities and the, and the big time joys. So in terms of repertoire, we should play repertoire that best suits us and not try and think that we're going to attain some level of grandeur <laughs> because we've chosen a really hard piece. It doesn't really work that way. It actually works in reverse. If you don't play something that makes you sound good, you sound worse. So my biggest advice is play something that showcases you well, something that you love and you want to wake up every day and play because it's a daily effort to do a competition. Another piece of advice I give about repertoire is check the additions. I think it's important to know what the composer was striving for. And we play all over the world in different countries and we all play different ways. And unfortunately, we are categorized as our country ascribes. You know, we're an American flutist or a French flutist or a German flutist. And I think if we could all just come together and play music, and represent our artistry that wins competitions. And that I hope is the only way I've ever gotten a prize is just through being myself. Extreme musicianship, if I call it. Mm -hmm. It's something that is selfless. It's something that's scholarly. It's something where you really attempt to bring the composer and your variety of genres to the fore. So if you can bring your repertoire and your additions you know, the scholarly editions and everything uh, into a beautiful equation into your own product, you bring that into a competition, you cannot be judged anymore, because you are representing your work and your heart and your knowledge. And it doesn't matter where you're from. Now, it does matter where you're from, if you are going to go somewhere to do a competition. I That's a completely different podcast, I think. Yes. <laughs> you have to be careful where you're going to choose to do your competitions. But if you can stay friendly and local and really just work your way through your own journey of competing, as we call it, that's the best advice I can give. And the rewards, I would say, this is my advice. Who is anyone to judge us in the end Hmm. when what we're doing is beautiful? Hmm. 
So when it comes to beautiful person pitted against another beautiful person Mm -hmm. (laughs) and someone gets the money and someone doesn't, and let's say you don't get the money, I think it's still in your best interest to never give up and just keep leaping, you know, and understand that if you're getting as far as you are in competitions, it's a validation. Mm -hmm. Keep going. I have many, many, many friends in many, many, many beautiful jobs now. But 25 and 35 years ago, we were all together and we were not who we are now. And we were struggling and we were watching Jean-Pierre and Paul and we were watching James Galway. We were watching our teachers, Ms. Backstresser and Mr. Barron and Mr. Baker. And Mr. Baker was not my teacher, but he was there. And it was all our, um, it was people you could rely on to give you really amazing feedback. And so we were all there struggling. And so we would enter competitions and be together in these competitions. And then we would realize that, hey, we got this far. (laughs) We must be doing something right. So in the end, the rewards of, I don't think you can call it losing. I think you can just call it learning. I think the rewards of learning to do competitions is that you gain a perspective of yourself that you can do this and it's worth it. Mm, I love all of that. Thank you so much, Amy. It's very giving advice and extremely uh, nurturing and down to earth. So if you'd like to, we can dive into two specific repertoire requirements that are required of the NFA and TFS. If you want to, we can dive into TFS's Myrna Brown competition East Wind for Solo Flute by composer Ron. If you'd like to give some advice on how you'd coach this solo flute piece, we would love to hear it. Well, sure. In fact, I have a bit of a story. Uh, I was a guest of the Texas Flute Society, and at the time, I believe it was 2000, might have been 11. Yes, you were guest artist in 2011. Okay, good guess. (laughs) I can know that because of my student, Seth Morris. Yes. Uh, I know that because he was my right hand, my assistant, my graduate student instructor. And at the time he was doing competitions and, you know, trying to feel his way through. And so he entered Myrna Brown and I said, well, be careful. You know, I'm a judge in this competition, so I might recuse myself. But Seth, I don't mind recusing myself because you can win your own darn competition. (laughs) Yeah. I'm the first person to try and have, you know, a very good jury and a common jury throughout competition, unlike some competition. So uh, TFS was it was great. He got in the finals. And so I sat I went all the way back to the top of the hall in that in Denton. Mm -hmm. And I sat in the top row and (laughs) Seth played the East Wind like it was meant for him. Hmm. And the last note, I said, listen, Seth, the last note, people don't listen to the middle of the piece. Seriously, Hmm. maybe the jury does. But in general, you're taught in performance as a soloist, people listen to the beginning. And then they listen to the end. Hmm. And they come out and they say, wow, wasn't that great? And they don't really talk about the middle. So I said, listen, at the end, it's a it's a real big dip down. Mm -hmm. And you need to dip as far, the tongue dips, the frown dips, the head can dip, your torso can dip, and you need to keep that air flowing though. So take a big breath and just don't give it away and like start bending and go, right? And and it goes down and he got so soft, literally Heidi, he blended in with the air handling system. Oh my gosh. Because he took his flute away and I was like, oh my gosh, that's the same pitch as the air. Whoa. <laughs> ah, I was so happy for him. <laughs> I thought, okay, if he doesn't get this, that's fine. But wow, that was impressive. You know, let's go back to the opening, right? Sure. So I tell you about the opening and the ending. The opening, I'm really having success with the syllable hata. So if you say hata, and you, I'm not going to go loud because I don't want to peak. <laughs> yeah. awesome. but you just save it so hot when you say hot ta the act of sucking the air back in and saying ta and then you you increase the vibrato you increase it 
you breathe and you come in with that as loud as you left the A Mm -hmm. and you bridge the breath. So, So I'm always talking about bridging the breath. That means leaving a note, breathing and coming back in on the next note exactly the way you left it. Okay. And that is so powerful. It's also powerful when you're having a moment when you're losing air. (laughs) You're like, oh my God, I'm running out of air. And then so you're going, you think to yourself, okay, I think I'll just bridge the breath. And Mm -hmm. so you come in and you you enter again, not louder, but just at the same volume. So, you know, it's very forgivable. Right. So I would say that, and then again, keep up the momentum, the whole first line, the whole second line. It's just this, it never ends. Mm. It's punching you in the face this whole time, this pa- this piece. And um, I have to say that's the way uh, Seth uh, practiced it and performed it and ended up winning this competition. So I'm, I'm happy to see that it's back um, in seven years later. It's very powerful. Of course, it's got a uh, biblical references. But if you listen to Ms. Ron talk about it, it's very powerful for her. Mm. She, the flute is a powerful instrument. So I'm happy that the flute can show power other than the way people are used to it. Right. I love the adjectives that you use to describe this piece and saying powerful and it punches. And I think those are great adjectives to describe this piece very well. I remember when Seth Allen was announced the Myrna Brown winner, and I remember your face just lighting up and being so proud of your student. That was a very special moment for me to witness. <laughs> That's great that you were there. What a nice, what a nice thing. Thank you. Yeah. So Professor Ran had kindly emailed me. I emailed her and said I would be talking with you and would she like to do a three-way call? And unfortunately, her schedule was super, super busy and she couldn't. But she sent me this lovely email and she put a lot of time into it. And she said that, of course, in addition to the performance notes at the back of the edition for Theater Presser, she listed more comments that I'll put on my website, but she wanted to make a point to talk about three different sections in this piece. And the first part, for those of you who have the score in front of you, the first part starts in the beginning, obviously, but the second part is at Temple One, at the very end of the page. The third section is on the third page with the E natural around the tempo change. And the final section is on the last page at tempo one. And um, she talks about those repeated Fs as being very ecstatic and lots of emotion there. But I just wanted to make sure that Ron's comments about those three sections were put out there so that way other flutists knew about it. But yeah, it's a very exciting piece. That's extremely fortunate information coming directly from the composer. It's incredible. Yes. Yeah. And just to see her. And one of my series was where I had talked with composers and getting into their mindset and how they prepare or how they go about the compositional process. Like what's their mindset and how they approach composition and composing flute pieces. And one thing I learned a lot from Gary Shocker and Daniel Dorf is that sometimes they have a formal plan, like the one I just listed from Composer Ron, and that really helps them navigate their emotions and what they want to be communicated to their audience. So I think just having the composer, like you said, giving that information is very helpful. So if there's not anything else you would like to say about East Wind, I would love to hear your thoughts about Telemann's A major fantasy. Well, Telemann's A major fantasy can cause a lot of trouble (laughs) (laughs) if you're not not in the blood flow of A major. Right. Uh, I, I, I remember messing up a lot in my youth. When you get to the, let's see, you're going along in A major and then you have an E major arpeggios. Uh, right? Yes. And then in A major and then in back into E major. So something that I've discovered in my teaching life is that the G sharp key is invented to mess you up. Mm. The G sharp key, think about it. It doesn't sit on the tube. It's not one of the holes that we cover. Mm. It's this off the flute. It's with our smallest finger. And if there is a problem, just check and see if there's not a G sharp or A flat in, or high E flat in that phrase, because I'm convinced that that little key, <laughs> at least for me, is just there to mess me up. So 
I would practice that little spot because even though you're making it fine in your rehearsals and your practice sessions, it's going to mess you up in the concert. Hmm. So I watch out for those beginning arpeggios. I call it defensive playing. Put your boxing gloves on. Just say to yourself, this could mess me up. Am I ready for that? You know, not, oh my God, I hope I don't mess up. But no, I'm not going to mess up. Is this going to, you know, mess with me? No, it's not. And whenever I've said that to myself, it's gone really well. Oh, wow. <laughs> not like I have to look at it closer. I just have to say yes. And the word yes, whatever thing you call down to help, you, the word yes is super powerful. And you say, yes, I can do this. That's that silly opening. That opening is really hard. So of course, I don't need to talk about how I play it because I've made a study guide on it. And then seven years later, released the audio of it because it was kind of hiding. So what I think of this Fantasia is that it's it's unlike any of the others. It should be unlike any of the others. He wants to teach us through these. So this, this one is about the different moods. We have recitatives, we have dances, we have beautiful melodies. So you have to play each little section with its own character. And of course, he does say allegro and then adagio later on with the A major arpeggios coming down. Mm -hmm. But who says you have to play them loud or soft? You could also articulate some. You could also add some ornaments. So just because it's an echo doesn't mean that it's necessarily only soft. It could be ornamented or tongued, okay. uh, articulated, just like I said. Then we get to, and, and it basically, I, I find it's in just two sections. <laughs> and then the final, you know, Telemann ended all of his Fantasias with a dance. And so you have to know uh, the dance style. It's actually slower. I, da, 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 you know, it's not very racing, mm. you know, it's not running. And take your time with the trills. Trills are very delicate. It's fun when you think of the wonderful Keith Underwood suggestion of trilling, where your key next to the one that's trilling is firm. So you just really get firm on the next closest key and then you trill and it really kind of gives your trill a good foundation physically. And then also in, in quick movements, the trills are just kind of light. They're just really light and short. So I think in Telemann's educational style, he's teaching us the Italian, the French, ornamentation in all different ways. And as I say on my study guide, he incorporates both in one Fantasia. Right. He's not trying to confuse us. He's trying to educate us. Hmm. Yeah. And don't forget that the French uh, ornamentation are those that are essential. They're the, the very light ones, the very quick ones. And in quick movements, they are quick. The Italian ornamentation is florid. Think of all the Italian artwork that you see, and you can be reminded of French versus Italian. So the florid, scaly, scaly passage work that you could do with ornaments is reserved for more Italianate movements. So you have to go and decide for yourself what you're going to do. Now, hmm. here we go into talking about your scholarly approach versus what you think the judge or jury might want. Mm. And that a lot of times can be double-edged. You can go into a competition saying this is an X or Y or Z country. And this is the way X, Y, y Z country wants me to play because I'm an American and uh, that has another label. So what I would encourage students to do is get their education on this work and this composer complete before they make their own decisions and then make your decision and stick with it. And don't ever doubt yourself. If you say to yourself, I've read everything that I can read. I've listened to Kaiken. I've listened to Brown. I've listened to Biznoziak. I've listened to everybody I can. And I've decided this is what I'm going to do. Then do it. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we want to give the prize. Me, the jury member, wants to give the prize to the person that makes me feel most comfortable. If you're comfortable with yourself and your product, that that's yeah. wonderful. And that sells tickets. And in the end, we know you have a career ahead of you. But if there's doubts and complaining and I'm not sure what to do, then you're not reading. You're just complaining. Mm -hmm. You're not searching. You're just talking. You're not doing. You're dreaming. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna is just the wrong vocabulary. I will. You know, I will do the ornament here and I will 
believe that this is correct because I've read Quantz and mm. Quantz yelled at me enough. Quantz yells at us. Even from 1777, he's still yelling. Yeah. And I'll open the book and I'll say to my student, I'm not going to yell at you, but Quantz is about to yell at you. <laughs> Ready? And they go, oh, really? And I go, yeah. And then I read a, I read one line. I look at them and they're, they're just oh, dumbfounded that, that someone that, that, you know, all those years ago, someone was still saying, if you dare take away from the most beautiful air in the world, how dare you, Mm -hmm. you know, don't insinuate your personality on, on a beautiful melody. And that's what Quantz is saying. So in the end, too much ornamentation is bad, too little ornamentation is maybe not so creative. And in the end, you, you have to believe in what you're doing. It's scholarly and right. And and I'll just add an addendum that everything I've put out, I've had my neck on the chopping block willingly. Mm. Because what I've done has been to the best of my ability, scholarly and from a deep state of lack. I've never put anything out there because there's been a lot of information. If you haven't noticed, no one was playing Carr Gaylord. And I thought, these are really hard and I need to either record them or tell people what to do. So that that's where these study guides have come from, from a lack. Hmm. Yeah, you saw a need. And you wanted to fill that niche in so that way others could benefit. Exactly. And I'm happy that they, you know, it trended, especially the anatomy of sound workshop kind of philosophy. I'm happy to say I think that's that's been the the biggest source of pride for me to see go forward was that the whole philosophy of my anatomy of sound. So um, anyway, but I I digress. Just back to Telemann, I think the biggest thing you could do for these competitions is come out and play your Telemann. Uh, the way you feel it needs to be. Now, let's talk about a little bit that horrible word vibrato when it comes to Telemann. I've found that if it can be in the back of the sound where it's not quite present, but it's kind of floating, mm-hmm. and that's the best vibrato you can use, especially for NFA, for those players. It's a, just a, a huge melting pot of players there who celebrate all kinds of styles. So I try to train my students to please everyone. So I know how to teach an excerpt, for instance, saying some conductors like you to go here and some conductors like you to arrive here. So what I want you to do is arrive both places and they end up winning the job because one conductor thought they went to their place and another conductor thought they went to the other place. So, wow. so it, yeah, it, it's very interesting in a competition to just say, this is me hmm. and this is what I know to be true. Hmm. And if you don't agree with me, I wish you well. Right. But just that confidence element, I love that. Just saying you've done your research, you've listened to recordings, and at the end of the day, you experimented as an artist and you were creative, and then here is my art. And just owning that, I think that's beautiful advice. A lot of people are scared to own their stuff. Hmm. I don't know why. (laughs) It's the only stuff we have. (laughs) Well, nobody else is going to give you, you know, advice for your own stuff better than you, you know, so I just think that if you can have confidence that you're actually picking up the flute in the first place, that's what you need. Hmm. I'll tell you uh, exercise, a very difficult exercise that I I do. I haven't had done it many times, but I'll, if the student is really down on themselves and doubtful and not owning their stuff, I'll take the flute and pretend I'm polishing it and ask them how they feel. And the student says, what are you talking about? And I said, well, how does it feel without the flute? And they go, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I don't think I'm going to give your flute back because you're just Debbie Downer and really, you know, down on yourself. And I can't do this. And I don't I'm worried. And I said, so I can't work with that. And you can't work with that. And that is just not an attitude. And what would it, does it feel better to have the flute out of your hands? <laughs> and of course they work backwards. What my first student that I did this to, cause she's so successful now, but the first student, she doesn't even remember probably. She said, Professor Porter, what kind of lesson is this? And I said, obviously a good one because you're pissed and that's good. I'm going to give you your flute back, but only because you now know how good you are. We need to know how good we are. Yeah. Now, that's not being, that's not a delusion of grandeur because basically classical musicians will say they stink and I'm no good and I can be better and we can be better. I'm better at 54 than I ever was, mm. I hope. So, and when I start, when I'm, when I break too many fingers, then I'll, then I'll stop. But <laughs> <laughs> my music, my music stands for me. And if you can't have your music stand for you, you should not get up on stage and definitely don't do a competition and play Telemann. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I couldn't agree more. 
And I think this was not planned, so we'll go with it. But I love all your social media blasts about you and your exercise routine. And I think a lot of just who you are and just seeing like the pieces I have through, you know, your Anatomy of Sound DVD. And I love the chapters where you talk about, you know, yoga and how that helps your mentality with um, just life or practicing. But I think a lot of what you just said right there about the confidence and owning it, I bet that a lot of that stems from your workout routines and just how you train your body. And a lot of that just is like also a mental training as well. Oh, you bet. Yeah. I walk in there and I say, Larry, I am not one of your athletes. He says, shut up. Yes, you are. <laughs> I, so one day I was in an outlet and I saw this t- t-shirt that says athlete, 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 and all these different colors. And I had to get it because I had to wear it during my workouts to remind myself that for him, I'm an athlete. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let me let me start from the beginning. The first time I ever sat on a yoga mat, I couldn't believe what happened to me. It was one of those situations where my student kept saying, my mom teaches yoga, my mom teaches yoga. And I thought, oh, yeah, I need a good stretch. And here I was, I, I was I had been a a little bit of a, you know, we had to do sports in our little school in Delaware. But at Juilliard, I was just walking to school. And I was just maybe going to a bar class or something. But Mm -hmm. nothing. There was no physicality at all. Hmm. And so when I sat on a yoga mat, what happened was <laughs> something that I, I didn't expect. And that was that I uh, turned on a light inside of myself. Hmm. And when you turn the light on inside of yourself that you're given and that no one else can give you, you can only find it yourself. It was green. And I realized that's the color of my eyes. Hmm. So I went for yoga, not as a religious experience, but as a kind of a, a, a body awareness. And I went to retreats and I did Kripalu, which is across the street from Tanglewood. And I thought it was so funny that I, there I was back up at Tanglewood where I had been in my 20s. And then I returned across the street to the ashram for a week just to see what it was like. And, and so I dabbled in just taking classes and it stuck with me, you know, just throw your yoga mat in anywhere. And the yoga mat gets powerful. When you sit on it, like I said, it's not like a religious thing. We're doing animal poses. We're doing postures that you practice your entire life because they evolve. And so, you know, your hand can always be straighter. Your arm can always be straighter, but it's you're growing and you're and they say flexible mind is a flexible body, flexible body is flexible mind. So with that at 30, oh gosh, I got here at 34. So I got my job at 34 and Throughout the Atlanta Symphony time, I had uh, learned to run from stop sign to stop sign in my neighborhood, but in no way was I a runner. So then I started running. I started running a little bit, but like I, I, I don't get really, really big time into everything. I just, just want to try it. And so I tried running and I've been running ever since. I, maybe I'll do four and a half miles. I'm not going to run a half marathon. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get me to run a half marathon. I just want to keep my weight down. And so the biggest word in weight loss is the word. It's just one word. And I know everybody's waiting for it, but it was one word when, when this woman, and I'm at now at this point, and I'm in my forties and I'm 20 pounds overweight. And a stylist has told me to lose weight because I'm making a DVD and I'm trying to go for, for something. This girl looks at me, she gets down in my face. She says, if you don't, we're in the middle of a training session. She said, if you don't get lower, I'm going to make you do 20 more. Hmm. And I said, why? And she said, because this is the strength that you need to go through your life. Hmm. And the one word she said was cardio, 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 cardio is what we need. The heart rate is a muscle. The heart is a muscle. It has to be taxed. It has to be trained. It has to be pushed. If you don't sprint, it's not, you're not going to get over these, you know, plateaus. And I love going for nice long runs. Oh my gosh. I get in so much trouble when I say I I went for a nice long run because my trainer now will say, did you sprint some? No, I don't want to sprint. So, so for me, I started pushing things at 44. So, so 23, I sat on a yoga mat, 33, I started running from stop sign to stop sign, 43, I met this girl who changed my life. And then finally, for five years, I've had this trainer named Larry Wiesman. He trains ice dancers. He tra- trains ice hockey teams. He's off ice training for a lot of athletes. Uh, he tr- trains pro tennis players. And he's got his own gym. And so it's just me. Hmm. And I don't have to deal with anybody looking at me. It's awesome. So really what I'm doing is very private. Um, mm-hmm. When I post it, 
when I post it, Heidi, it's because of people like you and other pe- women saying, oh my gosh, you're so inspirational. Mm-hmm. I don't give a crap about any of the other comments. The people that, that I'm inspiring are who I care about because I am inspired by people too. Mm-hmm. So, and other flute players who, who are working out. Like I said, I don't need to be an athlete. I don't need to, to weigh a certain amount. I just need to get it up 15 times and then it's done. And then I need to throw this around 15 times and then that's done. And then I need to get on the stepper for a whole minute. And then that's, you know what I mean? I do it. And when he tells me to do something, I do it. And yes, I get, I get my anger out. I get my joy out. I come in some days, I can't do it. And he says, okay, if you can't do it, you can't do it. Hmm. And he's right. If you can't, you can't. But if you can't, if you can, (laughs) then you can. And he has made me teach better sleep better, <laughs> eat better. He'll say, have you been in the kitchen again? He makes kitchen like sound like a bad word. <laughs> so really, Heidi, to be honest, this has just been survival of the flutist, you know, in terms of physical, physical survival mm. of playing flute, physical survival, breathing, getting the sound out to 1100 people, mm. being able to tour, getting up and you get off a plane and they say, you have a press conference now. We'll let you go up to your room for a couple hours. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Thank God I work out and I train so that I have the health to tour, that mm-hmm. I have the health to not get sick, you know, all the time. And then I have the, I, I don't know. It's just yeah. been so beneficial to everything, including uh, what I feel is called aging backwards, where hmm. I'm in more sh- better shape and feel like my skin and my, you know, everything is in better shape because the cardiovascular system is there because the muscles support joints because, you know, muscles support bones. It's so important. So Mm -hmm. for, yeah, I I really don't care what the, what anybody thinks, uh, but I appreciate you asking. (laughs) No, I think it's great because I really got into this cardio frenzy at the beginning of my DMA because my main thing with studying with Lisa Garner Santa in Texas was she just wanted bigger, you know, bigger sound for my sound to project. I'm like, I'm blowing, I'm blowing. And she's like, you have to run. You just need to run every day, at least a mile before you start warmups. And my only experience with running beforehand was not good. I did not like it. And I thought, okay, well, I'm in my 30s now. Maybe I have a different mindset. And when I got into on a treadmill or I got outside and started running, I became addicted I mean, I just love it because, like you said, I can sleep better. I have more energy. My sound just popped. I mean, it it almost felt effortless. <laughs> and you just feel really good. And when you feel good, I mean, that's obviously going to go through, you know, the different areas in your life. And oh, yeah. You spread joy. Especially yeah. when you're running around town. You're like, hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> you die all dog. You know, and you're, you're, you know, you spread joy. Yeah. And then that other person can spread the joy you gave them. Yeah, definitely. I love it. Perfect. (laughs) So in the last segment of the show, Amy, if you have any picks that you would like to offer the listeners, feel free to share. Oh, goodness. Ah, picks. So books or... It could be a book, a movie. It could be a recipe that you like to go to, a restaurant, a flute-related thing. It could be anything (laughs) you want. (laughs) Wow. Well, okay. So I'm going to tell you about a Pinterest board that I have. Okay. Did you, did you know I'm on Pinterest? I did not know that. I know. Isn't that fun? <laughs> it took me like one day, five hours to create a Pinterest board. So now I have a, I have an executive assistant, Lindsay, who's, who's helping me with my uh, Pinterest. But on Pinterest, there's a board called Over My Shoulder. Mm. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about being over my shoulder and being over my shoulder means how I cook. So I remember when I was the age of people listening right now, I had no idea when I walked in a store, what to buy, how to eat, how to, what do I cook? How do I cook it? Hmm. Is ramen noodles? Okay. Is that a food group? Is ice cream a food group? And in fact, is ice cream a protein? (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know any of this. I mean, did you? Did you? No, I'm actually, I got into cooking when I got married, actually. When I was in college and grad school, I really wasn't into it. And then when I got married, that became our thing. Well, it's not about, I I think 
you can call it cooking or you can just call it eating because I love to eat, but I found that I cook better than the restaurants. Now this is how we do it. You go to the store and you stick to the outside aisles. Mm. So you can just walk around the perimeter of the grocery store. You really don't need, unless you need your toilet paper, you don't really need to go in the middle aisles for a lot of stuff. Mm. And I go around and I just get one protein. I always grab a head of lettuce. I'm always grabbing some, just some vegetables or something. And then um, you swing around to the other side, maybe grab some garlic and I can't cook with olive oil anymore, but I'm cooking with butter. And so then you add, so you have a protein and you have some vegetables. And then if you need a carb, you can like peel a potato or grab some rice or, or quinoa or something. And that's really a beautiful way to end your day by grabbing something under $20 from the grocery store instead of a takeout from your restaurant that has no love in it. Mm-hmm. And instead of fast food from the freezer, you're getting a protein. So what you're going to do is you're going to take home this piece of meat or your fish or your vegetable or whatever, your, your zucchini for those vegetarians out there. And you're going to, you're going to prep it first in a pan on the stove so you can brown it and in butter or olive oil or your favorite spice and then stick it in the oven for 20, 25 minutes at 375 and cook everything else while you're doing that. And talk to your friends. Invite your friends over. Talk to your husband. Pet your dog. You know, have the old-fashioned dinner for yourself. Because that, to me, is the most joyful time of my day. Mm. I can talk to a friend. I often, Marco Polo, I have the Marco Polo app. And my friends leave me Marco Polos. <laughs> and I listen to them while I cook. And then I let I give them a Marco Polo back while I'm cooking. And I show them... Um, when I'm cooking, I also make my own dog food because my dog is a purebred lab and she ha- was losing her hair. So she can eat, we tested her blood, she can eat six things and I take those six things like salmon and uh, oatmeal and carrots and peas and, and lamb and I put them all together in patties for my dog. So they're in the freezer. I make my own freezer patties for my dog food. So the food, fresh food is super important and I think that's the advice I'd give to all the young, younger flutists out there that enjoy food and music is that your best meal is by you. You can cook. And if you just do a protein and and some veggies and just a little bit of carbs, um, um, and you're just going to have a a much better life. And when I learned this, my life, my life completely changed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this podcast actually started with series one and talking about how to take care of yourself first and foremost. Cause it, I mean, it did. yeah, yeah, yep. That's awesome. yeah. Yeah. Cause I had this like epiphany, you know, again, I don't know what happens in your thirties, but in my thirties, I had this epiphany like, oh man, I'm, you know, feeling sluggish. I don't have energy. I don't feel good about myself. And then when I started changing my diet and exercising, I felt exactly what you said earlier, reversed aging. I felt better in my thirties than I ever did in my teenage years or twenties. And right. so, yeah, it's, you really are what you eat. And man, quinoa and some salmon and some asparagus. Oh man, you you can't right? get any better than that. That's pretty darn cheap. Now, I did hear a woman the other night, and I had to shut my mouth at it. I just listened, but she said, "Oh, exercise. Who has time for that?" Yeah. Who doesn't have time for that? Yeah. I mean, you so, can just do 20, 30 minutes if you're really pressed for time. Well, but. yeah, but it has to be very, very, you know, sweat. You can't just oh, read your course. read your social media and sit and go up and down oh, on something. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's no fun. And then take a selfie. Yeah. Say, I worked out. <laughs> I worked out and look, my makeup is perfect and there's no sweat marks at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh you gotta shoot! Work for it. You gotta work for it. Well, stuff doesn't start showing up until your thirties, and um, yeah. in your twenties, you think you're pretty much um, impervious. But yeah. um, but you should feel that way. I think I think when I was in my twenties, I could do anything, and and I felt like I could. So I encourage everybody to get their get their gusto up, and you know, take a walk around the block if you don't believe in yourself, because you're the only one who can believe in yourself, and then you'll start exercising and eating right, and and then you'll play great flute. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for your time and expertise. And we so appreciate your willingness to share the knowledge you have about these pieces and competitions in general. And I wish you all the best as you wrap up this academic year. And I hope we get to be in touch in the near future. Yes, Heidi, don't be a stranger. Your podcast is amazing. And thank you for for 
calling me to be on it. Oh, thank you so much, Amy. Well, you have a great rest of the day and we'll talk very soon. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Today's episode is sponsored by J&K Productions. They produce all of my episodes from adding the intro and outro music to editing the audio and all post-production needs. Contact them for your next podcast project at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.